Hello, awesome students! Today I want to talk to you about PARC. This year, students from all over the country are taking a new type of assessment to see how well they're learning and so teachers can improve their education. This assessment is called PARC. Now PARC is important. Think about it like going to the doctors. Every year, many kids go to the doctor for a checkup and to see how much they've grown. Park is the same thing, just for your education. We want to give you a checkup and see how much you grow every year. Park is two assessments. The first part's going to be mid-March, and the second part's going to be toward the end of the year. And oh yeah, something else. Park is totally online. Since Park is online, it can ask better questions in new ways. Let's take a look at some of them. Before we get started, I want to give you the best tip I can to doing well on the park. You have to read the directions. Um, as we get started, your screen will look like this. Uh, down here, you will see the directions for this section. After you've read them, enter your name and hit Start Test Now. We will see that we are in Session 1. It has 39 questions, and when I'm ready, I can start the section. Let's take a look at the top of the screen first. We will see a blue arrow and a gray arrow. These are how I navigate from question to question. Clicking the blue arrow will take me to the next question, and we will see the gray arrow has become blue, and that is how I go back to the previous question. If you don't understand a question, you can hit the flag question for review button, and later, when you want to come back to a question, you can open the review panel, which will show you what questions have been answered, what has not been answered, and what has not been viewed yet. So if I want to go back to question one, all I have to do is click view question. I can also filter my questions by answered and flagged. I can look back at the all section, which will show me everything. And I can see up here as well how many questions have not been answered and how many questions I flagged for review. So since I didn't understand question number one and I want to go back and take a look at it, I'm going to go ahead and click view question and that will take me back to the question. So don't be afraid to flag a question to review later. We don't want to spend too much time on any one question we may not understand. One of the first types of questions you may see when you take the park practice assessment is a fill in the blank. Read the question carefully and when you're ready fill in what you think is the correct answer and simply go to the next question. The next type of question you will see on the park is multiple choice. I select what I think is the correct answer, but notice I can only select one answer. It's a good tip to know that a circle next to the letter means that you can select one answer. To help you while you're taking the park, they've included an answer eliminator. By selecting the answer eliminator, I'm able to cross out answers that I don't think are correct. To undo that, you would just click them again. This type of question is a checkbox question. Reading the directions, it says that I should pick two ways to show how to find the value of 7 times 40, selecting the two correct answers. So you can see in bold, it wants me to select two. So because the box next to the letter is square, I know I can select more than one answer. By reading the directions, I know that I should select two. This next question is an interesting one. By reading up top, I learned that Mr. Conley delivers packages, and this bar graph shows the total number of packages he delivered on five days last week. You'll notice that there is two parts to this question. Part A is multiple choice, because I see the circle next to the letter, so I know I can only answer once, but then we see part B is a fill in the blank. So part A is asking, what is the total number of packages Mr. Conley delivered on Monday and Tuesday? By looking at the graph, I can determine that he delivered 350 packages on Monday and Tuesday. But then take a look at Part B. This is where it can get tricky. Part B is asking how many more packages did Mr. Connolly deliver on Monday and Tuesday than he did on Thursday and Friday. Part B is actually looking for you to take your answer in Part A and plug it down here into Part B. So I know that Mr. Connolly delivered 350 packages on Monday and Tuesday, and I know he delivered 300 packages on Thursday and Friday, meaning that he delivered 50 more packages on Monday and Tuesday than he did on Thursday and Friday. I want you to be aware of, though, look how Part A 
and your answer plays a part in what is happening in Part B. Another type of question you might see during the Park Math Assessment is drag and drop. This question is asking me to drag and drop three quadrilaterals into the box. So you'll notice as I drag and drop, I have the ability to add three. But if I were to try to add more than one, it won't let me. So make sure you read the directions and look at what it's asking you to do. This next question is a different type of drag and drop. You'll notice that I have to put in the stars to complete the graph, as the directions tell me. However, there's only one star. You'll notice as you drag and drop, the stars can be taken from that one star up top. It's important to take your time so Park has time to respond to your mouse clicks. Let's say that you put in too many stars. All you would do is take your star, and even though my mouse and star aren't necessarily in line, I bring my mouse up to the star and let it go. So I'm putting my mouse cursor over the stack to delete. All right, guys, this next question is a great example on why it's so important to read the directions. It tells me I have to use the more or fewer buttons as many times as needed to divide the circle into six equal parts, then shade one-sixth the area of the circle. If I didn't read the directions, I might be confused as to how I'm supposed to get this circle divided into one-sixth. But since I read the directions, I know that I can add more lines to divide the circle into sixth, and then I can click by shading. If I need to go uh, to fewer lines, I would just hit the fewer button. Or if I just want to reset and start over, I can hit click the reset button. It's really important that you read the directions because you're going to run into questions similar to this one. This next question is asking me to plot the point that shows 5 sixth on the number line shown here. If I want to plot a point, I simply just click where I think the point should appear on the number line. If you're older, you may see a more in-depth version of the previous question. When I select a place on the number line, you'll see that it blows up so I can plot a more exact point. So between 3.5 and 4, I can find a place to plot this point, but you'll notice up here, right, it's still moving as well. Here is another example of a type of question I may see on the Math Park exam. It's asking me to graph points A, B, and C on the coordinate plane. So if I want to point, uh, plot point A, I would select A and plot it. Point B, plot, point C, and plot. If I want to undo a point, I would just keep it selected, and I would click over it, and it disappears. But here's the thing. If I click on point B, and I put it over point A, it doesn't actually disappear. It's still there. So if you need to remove or move something, make sure you do it by clicking and plotting and then unclicking it to make it go away. In this question, you'll see a more advanced version of the plotting of the points that we did in the last question. I have line S selected, and you'll see when I plot line S, or I plot the points, a line is created. Same thing for line T. And you erase them the same way that you did before, by re-clicking on them. And then we can see point P doesn't create a line because you're just plotting the point. In this question, you will see a part A and a part B, the part B being a text box that we type in that I've gone over. But part A, we will see that you might actually have to open a menu and select from the drop-down what you think is the correct answer. In this next question, I want to introduce you to the expressions and equation creator. You'll notice when I click on the answer area in this question, math expressions pop up. This can be a little confusing at first, so one of the things that you can do is mouse over each picture and pop-up text will tell you what it is that it is meant to be. So here we see this is meant for mixed numbers, this is meant for fractions, we have brackets, parentheses, we have the dollar sign, 
uh, multiplication, division, uh, the addition and subtraction buttons, as well as the less than and greater than, the equal sign. And then over here, we actually have the undo button, the redo button, and the clear all button. So let's say that I wanted to do 2 plus 2. We'll see that this little box here can be highlighted and allows me to enter a number. I can then hit the plus sign. Another box will appear. I can enter in the 2, the equal sign, and then I can go ahead, click, and enter in 4. If I want to undo what I have already done, I can hit this undo button, and it will take me back step by step through what I've already created so I don't have to start all over. If I want to redo something, it goes the opposite. So it remembers everything that I did. If I want to clear everything and start fresh, I would just do that. So if I think that this was going to be a mixed number, I would select the mixed number button and then you will see that I have my options and I could just enter in whatever I think the answer might be. The other thing to be aware of is you are not limited to just numbers. I can also enter in letters, but I cannot enter spaces. So that's something to keep in mind and is another reason why reading the directions is so important. If you're older, you may see the more advanced version of the math expressions that we talked about before. By clicking on the answer, you'll see that I still have undo, redo, and clear all, but now I have three menus here on the right. I have the math symbols, I have the relations, and I have the geometry. With all three open, I can scroll between them. And it works the same even though there's more options. I can insert my number, I can insert my symbol, insert my number, uh, whatever I need to do. So wherever you see a box, you know that you can insert a number or a letter. To undo, just go back and click, and it shouldn't be too much different than it is with the math expressions, uh, the simpler version. In this question, I'm being asked to create a histogram that represents the data listed above. So after I read the directions, to create my histogram, I could just select and drag, and it works in both directions, all the way up. Select and drag all the way back down. You also might run into a problem like this. Again, the best thing to do is always read the directions and think for a minute what is it asking you to do. For here, it's asking me for each figure pictured in the table, select the box for any statement that describes the figure. You may select more than one box for each figure. So this first part is asking me appears to have two parallel sides. The second column is asking me, has at least two perpendicular sides. I can select my answers or deselect my answers as needed, understanding that I might answer one for a column, I might answer two for a column, or I might not answer at all for a column. These are options that you can choose for your answers. Let's take a look at one of the trickier questions on this practice park exam. You'll notice I have a part A and part B, and you'll notice on the left here, it's giving me some information. I will see that I have a scroll bar, which allows me to see the rest of the information. So make sure that you're aware, if you see a scroll bar, there might be more things that you need to read or be aware of. In part A, I see that I have a drag and drop problem. Okay. In part B, I have an answer box where I should type in my answer. If I write something that might be letters or spaces, it's going to tell me an invalid input, but numbers doesn't give me a problem. Finally, if this math problem wanted to ask me how to measure some of these angles, you'll see up here in the toolbar that I can actually pull out a protractor. To manipulate the protractor, you can drag your mouse and rotate the protractor to make yourself uh, able to measure these angles if that's what the question was asking you for. Here's another example about why it's so important to read the directions. In this question, I'm being told that the area of the rectangular sandbox at Dave's school is 108 square feet. 
the sandbox has a width of 9 feet as shown in the diagram. If I didn't read the directions, I might be tempted to come up here and select the ruler and measure the side here. The problem is, if the width is 9 feet and I'm using a ruler that is 6 inches, that doesn't make much sense because I know the length is going to be longer than the width, so a 6 inch ruler doesn't really help me in this question. That's why it's important to read the directions. It will tell you to use the ruler or use the protractor. Chances are, if it doesn't tell you to use it, you don't need it. If you feel overwhelmed or nervous about PARP, don't be. Just remember to read the directions. Your teachers are here to help, and we're going to do lots of practice. We know that you're going to do great. So, let's get this practice PARP started.